just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? The Facebooking and the tweeting and the Instagramming, all that would not exist without our understanding of science. So it's amazing that you do that as an insult. You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else. Yeah, to absolutely, to you. because I can't prove either got to be true or not. I can't, no, no. Welcome back to A Really Radio 125B, recorded Friday, September 9th, 2016, where we uh, will continue to dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really. I'm your Stanley Cowan with my usual suspects. I've got David O'Connor, Stephen Griffith, Daniel Atherton, and Fred Sims had to drop out due to uh, a little bit of a, a massive headache. I'm, I'm sure that it had nothing to do with us talking in his ears all night. Couldn't That's happen. fair. I would just like to say I like the massive dance number we all just had. That was top notch. <laughs> Since we are right back into it, it is time for one of our favorite segments, and I hope it's one of yours. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. That's right. We're back into science, bitches. So, <clears throat> I did not have the first, the first topic here. No. I had to go and throw a Brussels sprout into our science. Oh, pie. how dare you? Well, let's talk about it. So an article out on the Washington Post has yep. the, the world has lost a tenth of all its wilderness in the past 20 years. Yep. And really? What's yeah. <laughs> it, now the definition of wilderness is a place where there is no human footprint. Is oh okay, so, so definitionally, is really what what's happened. Okay, so a place without a human footprint. We within the past twenty years, we've lost ten percent of it. By uh, human footprint, you mean just people going through and exploring, or people actually living in that area? Um, a, a place where 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 humans have uh, regular interaction. Uh, so, no, that that whether they live there or they they continuously visit. Yeah. So we okay. we have lost a lot of those, zones, and some of those have been like fully deforested, um, mm. or have been put to human use. So it, it, it's disappearing. The 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 wilderness areas in like. South America and Africa were heavily, heavily hit within these past two decades. Um, but again, if you were a child of the 90s, uh, you know about South America rainforest just disappearing, um, clear yeah. cutting, uh, slash and burn, which while a number of those practices have changed, some of them have come back into vogue because guess what? They're easy. That is true. So the study that's published in, uh, in the journal um, Current Biology, which you can find out uh, on cell.com, Current Biology, you can find the full text out there, uh, it was published on Thursday, finds that just over 30 million square kilometers, or 11.5 million square kilometers, of wilderness remains on Earth composing nearly a quarter of the planet's terrestrial areas. So we're not dealing with, you know, the, the oceans, because, well, that's all wilderness to us, even though that we do have plenty of impact. Uh, but on the other hand, 3.3 million square kilometers have been lost since the early 1990s. Just the 1990s. I'm getting a lot of audio feedback And it's not on my end. It's one of you guys. Are you all muted? I just did a mute of mine and didn't hear a change. Oh. It's you, Dan. 
It's always me. <laughs> That's so weird. I don't. I don't get it. Okay. I think Skype has just potted you all the way up or something, and it's getting all sorts of uh, yeah, you know, nasty noises. Okay, let's uh, let's soldier on. We we at least know that you're the cause. Sir. <laughs> it's okay. We'll figure it out, though. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's we'll have sorry a couple seconds of silence, and he can edit it out in post. <sighs> no, I can't. <laughs> it's 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 it permeates everything, unless of course you mute it, and then that actually don't mute it. Yeah. The noise reduction filter? Don't don't mute it. Come back. That there's a reason. Because if I use the noise reduction filter and he mutes it, then it it takes it down and then it gets an inverse wave from what it was removing from the DC offset for the rest of it. it oh good times. Yeah, it, it, it gets really weird. So Yay um, for flipping the register. A more consistent sound is better than it just coming and going because then the coming and going just gets louder if you have okay to, yeah how's that that is significantly better or at least Oof. better enough it'll so, be fine yeah okay <clears throat> so yeah that is a significant amount of uh of land now what what is, does the article say we can do anything or are there any takeaways failing to take the problem seriously could lead to Largely irreversible outcomes for both humans and nature, the researchers can cautioned in the paper. If these trends continue, there could be no globally significant wilderness areas left in less than a century. Okay, there's the takeaway. Got to get off this rock. But then we'll yeah, just I do it. it. But then we'll just do it to another rock. No, that's fine. That's fine. We'll survive. No, we the need to fix this, this rock, rock. Might have some problems once the wilderness is gone. <laughs> As no, we need both. We need to get off this rock and fix this rock because there will still be people left here. Yeah, not everyone can leave. No, because no. everyone can leave, but it's because gonna... wilderness deforestation is racist. That's a call, <laughs> call back to the first show. Oh, so, well, yeah. well done. <laughs> Kidney punch. Wow. Oh no! Oh jeez. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Third yeah, world yeah. people are the first to die, but That's, not the first to fly to the sky. True enough. True enough. Okay, so moving away from nature into the thing that is probably the most opposite of nature, let's talk about CPUs. <laughs> that is. <laughs> Com- comes from the crystal. Like a complete opposite, though. Um, apparently, from this point forward, all Intel and AMD CPUs, new ones are going to be made for Windows 10 only, meaning that they're not going to have significant, compatibility. significant drivers and things like that for Linux and alternative operating systems. Yeah, but those alternative operating systems was just recompiled for the new hardware. Well, as long as people make the drivers for them, and, and in many cases the drivers are given by the chip manufacturer to the open source community making their job a lot easier. Mm-hmm. So Intel announced and launched its KB Lake and Apollo Lake ref- refreshes this week, kicking off its latest initiatives while AMD demonstrated Zen and its upcoming Summit Ridge platform earlier this month. Such announcements typically come with their own laundry list of new features and capabilities, but it's worth remembering one feature that prominently won't be in any CPU or APU products from either company. Windows 7 or 8 support. So it's it's kind of funny because a lot of manufacturers have been making their BIOSes UEFI compliant. And a part of that UEFI standard is that it locks it into a particular operating system because that way the operating system can verify that the hardware itself has not been tampered with. It's all part of the security package. A lot of people don't care about that. (laughs) So as long as manufacturers continue to put in a little back door, basically, that says you can turn that off and then you can boot other operating systems, then you're fine. So really, this just makes it more difficult for power users that want to do something other than just go with Windows 10, just you know, stay on the on the latest PC kind of refresh. 
So it's actually a BIOS change? Well, the BIOS has to be written to use the CPU properly. Mm -hmm. So it it's a hardware lock-in where both the the motherboard and the CPU are intertwined in such a way that they lock down the system as a complete unit. Hardware okay. checks and things like that. You can still pop in a new chip. You know, you can still get a motherboard from Asus, AMD. You know, and any any of the big board manufacturers. You can still get a get a board, and you can still ad hoc get a chip from the manufacturers, and you can put on whatever you like. You can mix and match and things like that. And for the PC builder, this is not even an issue, really. No. It is for the people that are, dude, you're getting a Dell. Dude, you're getting an HP. You know, the Lenovo's and all that. Those are the ones that are coming with a locked down UEFI BIOS that is only made really to boot Windows 10. Okay. I was worried when I saw this that it was like, <clears throat> are they making changes to the actual instruction set on the CPU to where it'll only run Windows 10? No, having, having delved a little deeper into this and looking at other things. Uh, no, they said, yeah, no, it'll run. It's basically the idea that they don't want to be backwards compatible. Yeah. Um, so don't worry about that. But no, it'll still run Linux, OS X, BSD. It'll run those, no problem. Yeah. You just may have to go th jump through some hoops so that you can boot to an alternative operating system. Well, sure, it's always been like that, so. Well, no, not always. Not always. This is <clears throat> another step than what you might be used to. Okay. Because you used to just be able to boot up to a like an Ubuntu CD or USB drive and just run it. Mm-hmm. Not so in this anymore. It would unless, it would unless you build your own not system. Boot. Right, but even some of those manufacturers may have it on by default. Mm. So then you'd have to go in and really tweak your settings. But <laughs> if you're building it yourself, you're going to do that anyway. Yeah. So this is less a report for the power users, and this is more a, hey guys, that might be going from being just a a basic user of I'm just going to go buy the PC and whatever it comes with, I'm going to be happy. You will not be able to roll back to Windows 7. You will not be able to roll back to Windows 8. It's it's Windows 10, period. So a lot of, uh, a lot of other manufacturers, well, um, this will affect corporate users in a way because the machines that are coming off the assembly line right now have to run Windows 10. Whereas before, there was a backwards compatibility allowance. So if the, if the enterprise had not moved forward to Windows 10 and they were stuck on Windows 7 for whatever reason, they could then roll back and the same license key essentially that they got with the box would still go with that as well. Hmm. So again, it's all licensure and, and some crazy stuff. But at this point going forward, your enterprise out there isn't going to be able to do that without jumping th through some other serious hoops. Neat. Because it's going to be blocked down by the physical hardware itself. Well, this could actually really affect, from a corporate standpoint, because I've, I've worked for places mm -hmm. both as tech and non-tech where it's, you know, their standard operating package that they image onto all systems are, right. you know, here's Windows 7, or old days, here's Windows XP. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, yep, which means this will kill them and uh, they have software that doesn't work on anything other than X operating system. Right. Yeah. So this could kill like a lot of corporate orders, like the mass orders of machines, unless they're doing a complete and total upgrade of everything they've got. Uh, I'm just going from friends and family. This this really affects the medical field because mm -hmm. a lot of that software that you're talking about that only works for that particular operating system happens a lot in the medical field. Yeah. Yeah. I've still seen systems nowadays that still have to run DOS apps. Yeah. Uh, I've, at the company I work for, there's a, there's a set of machines that are running some very expensive hardware that if they wanted to upgrade, the they're running an ISA card in the, oh. in the machines. Yeah. Oh. So uh, it's DOS and Windows, uh, Windows 3.1. Yep. Yeah. My soul. Yeah. So if they wanted to upgrade, they'd have to spend like sixty thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per card, and they're running a bunch of these machines. 
And they still do the job. All they're doing is is it's like a uh, a GCMS, a gas spectrum mass spectrometer, or something. I don't know. Um, that's not my science. That's not where I, where I am. But that's all they're doing. And the these tests are not any more advanced. It's just the the interface technology itself has upgraded. The bandwidth has upgraded. Things like that. It might do the test faster. I don't know. But they they'd have to do that, and then they'd also have to upgrade the machine itself. Which is another like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so they're saving uh, at least a quarter mil per machine by just continuing to run a machine that they can only get parts off eBay for. Wow. Yep. Yeah. So, and we have to continue to deal with that. So, yeah, the industry does not always move forward because sometimes the industry cannot move forward. So. There are always edge cases like that. And being an IT guy, that's really where you live. That's where you make your bread and butter is by being very familiar with those edge cases and making a home for yourself where they can't get rid of you. <laughs> Until it becomes too expensive to keep you around. Right, but then you're then what it is is you are then a part of the transition team to the new hardware, and then you get to know that real well, too. <laughs> there's, always yeah. a, there's always a way. <laughs> yeah. Because as long as the business itself doesn't go away then you, you can find a niche. So, But you are correct. There's always a way to get rid of you. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, this headline, I don't like. <laughs> no, it's, it's clickbaity, but it, it yeah. does get the message across that they have made a change, and this is, this is what their intention is, mm -hmm. at least. So. Yeah, the, I, I understand why they do this, but I also hate that. Microsoft works with hardware developers, and hardware developers willingly do stuff like this to basically, yeah, it's still backwards compatible, but we're going to tell you that it's not, and we're going to make some minor changes that make it seem like it's not actually backwards compatible. It still right. is, but it's going to act like it's not. Yeah. So like that, that grinds my gears a little bit. Yeah, some, it's, it's taking advantage of an ignorance of the way the machines work. Because really, if you know how it works, they cannot prevent you from doing it. There's always a way. Yeah. It's like saying that your E85 you know. vehicle will never run on gasoline. It's going to run on gasoline just fine. Yeah. <laughs> it absolutely will, will take it, and it will run, and it will run great. Yeah. But you just told everybody that it's not going to. <laughs> yeah. Because you didn't tell them that all they had to do was flip the switch, and it would do fine. That's a good analogy. Or, or flash the BIOS. You know, because mm -hmm. flash that EEPROM, do it. So you can uh, you can dig into that a little more if you like out on the show notes. Uh, but this one, this one next here, this is something that we really need to see. Oh, this is going to be great. So the impossible EM drive, the drive that simply defies the laws of standard physics as we know them, is going to be tested because so far. They think it works, and they're not it, sure why. It passes muster, and they yeah. can't explain How? why it is. Well, again, it's the whole thing of everyone's heard of Newton's third law. It's the whole law mm -hmm. to each action, or for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Yep. The beautiful thing about this drive is it goes, no, just kidding. That doesn't apply in this case. Well, I think the answer is actually still yes. It's just a, a different propulsion method that we don't understand what it's pushing against. It's occurring in a different quantum state? Possibly. It could be just straight up magnetics. Maybe it's a dark matter engine. That would be cool. That yeah. would be freaking wicked. That would be very cool. Um, it's like, well, it, it's, it's kind of, this is the edge case of, of science and technology. Where this is the you end discovery up of penicillin for space flight. Yeah, yeah. It's like you we, know, we don't, we don't know, we don't know why, why it works, what it but does, it does. But this shit's antibiotic. <laughs> this stuff here, this is awesome. How does it work? No idea. <laughs> Again, how's it work? Uh, I don't know yet. We are going yeah. to have an entire group of, of of students coming up through college that they're just going to study how this thing works because yeah. we don't know. Step yeah. one, build the drive. Step two. Figure it out. Step three, orbit. <laughs> yeah. Step four, profit. 
<laughs> oh yeah, and of course step we're, five, try to figure out how it works. Yeah, we're we're trying. We're trying definitely to get. Wait a second, what? It could produce enough thrust to blast humans to Mars in just seventy days. Yep. The Wh- the beautiful what? thing with this drive <laughs> oh, is because yep. because you don't have to store the fuel on board. You just need solar cells. So the the issue with going further out in the solar system is you have to slingshot around a bunch of planets because you don't have a consistent source of thrust. With this, you just need solar panels and wires. <laughs> just have a power source, yeah. You just have to have a power source, which you're in space, aim something at the sun, boom, power. Apply to drive, boom, go to, the, go to Mars. And you don't have to spend months and months slingshotting around other planets in the precise pattern up. to get to Mars. You simply just go. <laughs> British scientist Roger uh, Scheuer, who invented the EM drive in the early 2000s, uh, disagrees that his design violates the conservation of motion. Quote, to put it simply, electricity converts into microwaves within the cavity that push against the inside of the device, causing the thruster to accelerate in the opposite direction. However, it's a little bit like blowing into your own sail. It a little bit. Work. Yeah. Which shouldn't work because of no. physics. But because, because that's something you learn in like first year physics class, you know, is if you're on a boat and you blow into the sail, you will not go anywhere because you are acting on a device that you're on. There are some yeah. weird properties to magnets and copper. <laughs> Apparently that, uh, yeah. that occur. Like, uh, have you seen the videos of the magnet getting dropped down a copper tube? Yes. Yes. A, a thick a thick walled copper tube. And you take a neodymium magnet, you know, mm-hmm. big, a big disc magnet, and you drop mm. it down the tube. It goes slow. <laughs> it goes yeah. really slow all the way through. But, you know, yep. that's why and we have a, electricity. There's a similar effect of with uh, magnets and aluminum. Hmm. Magnets actually actually have a physical force that, that um, it's like aluminum rod goes slowly through. It, it feels resistance to that force. So there, there's another test where they, they drop a magnet towards an aluminum block, and uh, just before it hits, it like slows down and then gently comes to rest against the aluminum. Weird. <laughs> totally huh. weird. Nobody can explain why this is happening. So... This drive is cool, not just because it opens up potentials of space travel that we did not have before, but also because it's going to teach us things about the world around us that we don't understand. Actually, the thing is to think about it is just, you know, it took the Juno space probe five years to go from essentially Earth orbit to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. This thing says it will take a human spacecraft from here to Mars in 70 days. Mm-hmm. Imagine something smaller and lighter. Oh, yeah. We will now start getting probes faster out there to actually see, you know, people are curious, what's actually happening with Europa? Is there a liquid ocean under there? If so, is there possible life? Well, guess what? We can actually send timely probes out there now to figure this stuff out. Well, if we, yep. if we finally really get on to making enough thermocouples, you know, radioactive uh, isotope thermocouples which by the way some weird stuff happened there i don't know if you know about it um out there in in listener land but we had we stopped making them we ran out of visible material and and things that were left over um because we stopped making you know nukes (laughs) at some point so and it was uh, uh plutonium uh 238 i believe that's what's used in the um in the thermocouples that go out in, in spacecraft. Neat. That, those are the nuclear generators. And all it is is they are constantly emitting a lot of radiation as heat. So they just put basically a thermocouple on it, and it just oh. generates electricity constantly, all the time. Day, night, doesn't matter. Is the you reason know? why Voyager 1 still functions? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's still pumping out power. <laughs> It keeps going and going and going. Just (laughs) wee! 
it's still that's what it's doing. But we ran out, we ran out of the, out of the material. The the way the Russians had made theirs, they ended up with a big stockpile of it. So we started buying it from them. So we're basically out of it now, and we need it desperately because it takes a lot of this material to actually make enough to be a um, uh, an RTG. I guess uh, it will just abbreviate it to that. But one of those uh, one of those devices, and we can't make it fast enough. We just can't. So they're having to spin up the program. And it used to be part of the Department of Energy to maintain all the equipment for it. And then they said, we don't want to do that anymore. NASA's the only ones that need it. NASA gets to pay for it. At $50 million a year, I think, yeah. just to keep the equipment up. And then it was another twenty million or something on top of that to continuously start the start the roll up for the for the project. So in order to get enough for a good probe, it was going to take like three years of constant manufacture to build enough material for one radiothermal isotope generator for a probe. And that's not really tenable, which is why we still have a lot of solar panels out there. <laughs> Because every one of those that is, you know, expanding, expanding, expanding into giant solar arrays, they're doing that because they didn't have enough money and they didn't have enough, uh, enough of the material itself to get it up in, into space that way. Because they would all prefer to use that because it makes it so much easier. It's tiny. It, it's by mass ratio. It just makes sense to have it. But no, no, no. Well, so. don't forget, don't forget. Penny for no NASA. Nu- no nukes in space. <laughs> no nukes in space. No nukes in space. That that's the thing. It takes yep. a long time to get approval, even to use them. But just the, the the stupidity of that statement always just made me just go, "What?" Yeah. You realize space is like ninety eight percent hard radiation. Oh, it's yeah, it's a very hostile environment. A multi megaton nuclear device isn't going to be even a blip. Right, well, they're just, it's not, it being in space, they're worried about it falling back. That's, that's the problem. I, I know, I know, I know. It's okay, yeah. really, but people are scared of things that they do not understand. And we've already been through that people on this planet don't understand a whole lot. So this, uh, this is, a, is, is a fantastic thing. But it's going to require some nuclear energy to continue to give it power over the long expanse to maybe Alpha Centauri. Or maybe fusion. Well, yes, but we don't have that yet. Q Lockheed. Well, that's, you guys, how that's are you guys doing one. on that five years to <laughs> functional prototype? Sustainable fusion. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, that is not one of our stories today. We'll have to come yeah, back. Stay tuned for a future that. episode. Exactly. <clears throat> but with that, come on. Where's the thing? Hit the button. I, I did hit the button. But, I, oh, I muted it. Hey, there it is. How dare you mute the gavel? <laughs> oh, I was muting myself. That doesn't work at all. So, in, uh, in, in this week, and of course, many, 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 many previous weeks, we have learned that Native Americans and oil do not seem to mix very well. Um, not just as like a salad dressing, but definitely as, as a political statement, which is why this is in law and order. So, <clears throat> I don't know. Where do you guys even want to begin with this? Where, there's a lot to unpack. Yes, there's a lot to unpack. Here. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, well, let, let's do the, 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 the quick... Uh, in s- summary, okay. So we have the uh, North Dakota pipeline, which again transporting oil. It's another oil venture. Yeah, Yay! Not here. Keystone XL. No, it's something else. And they're trying to go across lands that are sacred to our, our Native American brethren. Like straight, like straight through burial grounds. 
Yeah, and they're not keen on it. Surprise, surprise. Um, and this has actually mounted a, a giant native protest movement. Um, there was a recent, uh, again, there was an injunction against this, uh, a uh, court throughout the injunction, and then we get this today. Uh, this th- came out today? Um, oh, yeah, Friday, this September came 9th. Out the 9th. From the Department Um, of Justice, Office of Public Affairs, for immediate release, Friday, September 9th, 2016. Joint statement from the Department of Justice, the Department of Army, and the Department of the Interior regarding Standing Rock Sioux Tribe versus U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So this isn't even a company, per se, that, you know, we we get to blame. It is a company. It is a private contractor that's actually building the pipeline, but they're building it on Army Corps of Engineers' land. Yeah. And, the, the well, it is their land, it's not their land. That's where it gets kind of a sticky wicket. Mm, okay. um, because the native tribes do treaties. Mm-hmm. They sovereign, should have this land. Yeah. However, also in the books, this is Army Corps of Engineers' land. It's both. And that's where the sticky wicket is. Because if it was just natives, well, we'd have a similar situation to what they're having in Canada, where the natives go, yeah, this is tribal lands, and the corporations go, we don't care. Um, well, yeah, but because since this is line. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers land, and, well, the Justice Department and the Obama administration are seeing the gradually increased coverage of this social media, and now actual news organizations are sending, you know, people out there to cover this. So this comes out today going, um, we ap- de-escalate this. We appreciate the district court's opinion on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act. <laughs> However, important issues raised by the Standing Rock Sioux Nation tribe, well, Sioux tribe, and other tribal nations and their members regarding the Dakota Access Pipeline specifically and pipeline-related decision-making generally remain. Therefore, the Department of the Army and the Department of Justice and the Department of the Interior will take the following steps. I would, I would like, like a bullet list at that point, but they don't do bullet lists, apparently. No, so, this is a press release. Yeah. The Army will not authorize construction constructing the Dakota Access Pipeline on core land bordering or under Lake Oea. I think I said that right. Until it can determine whether it will need to reconsider any of its previous decisions regarding the Lake Oea site under the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, or other federal laws. Therefore, construction of the pipeline on Army Corps land bordering or under Lake Oea will not go forward at this time. The Army will move expeditiously to make this determination as everyone involved, including the pipeline company and its workers, deserves a clear and timely resolution. In the interim, we request that the pipeline company voluntarily pause all construction activity within 20 miles east or west of Lake Oea. Yeah, the main concerns here for anyone who hasn't been paying attention or the people who've asked for clarification yeah. is, again, the, the land that they're touching on that is both the tribal land and the Army Corps of Engineers land, it is where sacred burial sites are. It's where other sacred lands are located. But also one of their primary things they come up with is, you know, they bring up those arguments and go, okay, these are problems. But the main issue they have is going, hi, guys, you're building this thing up river of us. That river is literally where we get our drinking water and water for everything else we do from, plus is where we get one of our major food sources from. Mm -hmm. And we know pipelines spill. So you're literally putting us under a gun where at some point it's never going to be when it fails, or it's not going to be if it fails, it's going to be when. And you're literally going to build this thing through our sacred lands and eventually poison our water supply, essentially killing us, or, as I'm sure somebody has said out there, do what every white man has done before, which is simply just move them to someplace else. Hmm. <sighs> That's the basics of what's going on with this. Now, and 
further on the list mm -hmm. is we get this thing where the army and the Department of Justice is gone. We stop this. And now we kick the can. Uh, Congress now has to, should, revisit everything that involves this. You mean the Republican Congress? Well, yeah, well. Should new legislation be proposed to Congress to alter the current statutory uh, framework, framework and promote the goals that they mentioned above in yeah. that paragraph? Yeah. So it's, hey, Congress, fix this. Well, yeah, and it's their job to do. Which Literally, their job to do. They're not very good at doing their job lately. No. no, but that's why all you listeners and all you viewers out there, November's important. We do have an election coming oh. up, and it was something like 70% of Congress is up for re-election. Vote. It's not yeah. just the presidential election, folks. Also, ask them about this specific issue. Ask them about a lot of issues. I found a, I found a website. I need, to, I need to pull that up, actually, because it's, it's, like, important and stuff. Um... About, you know, 20 questions, 20 science questions to ask. You're, ask your congressman. Ask everybody, yeah. So, it, good stuff. I'll, I'll find that and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes a, a bit later. But, yeah, so this is, um, this is fun. Yeah, this is breaking news. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there was a, a, a lot of breaking news with, I don't know, Jill Stein, a presidential candidate, actually going up and vandalizing some of the construction equipment. Oh, yeah. She spray painted on it. Yeah. Uh, the spur. Uh oh. Paint. Hey, Dan. Also, get it procured, which Steve fortunately pointed out to me earlier today, has some interesting history. You who, were breaking who, up bad. We couldn't who, hear who you has, that last sentence. Who has interesting okay. history? Um, the private security firm that works for the pipeline company. Yeah. G4. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Steve brought this up to me earlier in the day what's and their I company's just went, name wow yeah the company is called g4s they are a private security company also known as a as most people are referred to as a mercenary company um that has had been all over the world done things all over the world uh wherever they go there is always a problem uh they came to prominence just very very recently with this whole thing i'll get to the thing before okay but this whole thing because the People who were who had the security dogs and were unleashing them upon the Native protesters. American protesters was this company, uh -huh. um, and you can see some of the damage that the dogs did and some of the damage yeah you know, because of that the dog attacks yeah yeah um, that same company G4S recently or within the last decade or so employed a very interesting person who we are all aware of. Omar Martin, also known as the Pulse Club Shooter. Oh, is that who he worked for? This is who yeah. he worked for. This is the private security company oh. he worked for for about six, either six or nine years. So what you're telling me is that this is today's version of like the 1940s Pinkertons. Yes. That's okay. actually an excellent analogy. Except the Pinkertons were better. <laughs> Let's be honest. Were they, though? They well, were murderous. They were, they were murderers. Mm -hmm. they, they absolutely murdered strikers and set up nighttime ambushes uh, true. of strike I'll, camps. I'll grant you that. Were yeah. they better, though? <laughs> were they better at what they did? Well, that's I true. Think, were I they more effective? <laughs> the primary <laughs> difference now versus then is the speed at which information moves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You can't. You can't physically hide this. No. Yeah, this isn't just imagine... something that, you know, you might read in a newspaper in a week or two and go, eh, did that really happen? That sounds way out there. But also consider that the requirement of this where you've got this oil pipeline coming through this area. You have these Native American protesters who are well within their rights to go, guys, no. Mm -hmm. And so a mercenary company is hired to run security for this pipeline and were essentially given free reign to stop the protesters. Yeah, stop the protesters and make sure everything keeps going. 
that's fun. Now, there's also news of, um, well, the, the headline is, Federal Agency Busted in Elaborate Scheme to Sell Native American Land to Corporations. The Bureau of Indian Affairs exists, in theory, to assist Native Americans manage the 55 million acres of land that the federal government holds in trust for its Native owners. However, um, apparently the, there were some Times investigative reports uh, revealed that in a... In practice, the BIA routinely helps outside corporations lowball landowners so they can exploit the native resources for maximum profit. Going back to the thing we read in the Republican platform, mm -hmm. you're not using your resources effectively. Let us help you exploit those resources properly. Oh, geez, you're damn right on that one. Yes, um, I am, and I hate that I am. Yeah. Uh, quote, little scientist, I remember this crap. It's true. Quote, they attacked my aunt like a bunch of coyotes attacking sheep in a corral, said Navajo uh, Roberta Tovar. Uh, quote, they were going, Mary, Mary, just go ahead and sign it. <laughs> uh, the BIA encouraged Mary Tom to renew the Western Union's rights to use her land for a measly $2,000 bonus. Uh, given that the average tribal member... Average income barely tops 10000 with unemployment rates averaging $10,000. Uh, $10, Tom eventually signed the papers, but only after the BIA insisted upon sitting down at a private meeting with Western Union without any trusted family members being permitted to attend. Records also show that representatives from the BIA had a pre-meeting with Western Mo Union before she arrived. Of course. That's... Pretty darn shady. It's not shady. It should be a business as usual. Again, people, anybody out there who's familiar with the idea of, you know, you've looked at the idea of maybe leasing your land or, hell, renting out your house or something else, you can mm -hmm. understand how much, you know, you can make with that. You can make some fair amount of money or, you know, with however you lease the land. Uh, continuing from this article, mm -hmm. a report from the Interior Department discovered that in 2015, 60% of Native landowners made less than $25 from leasing and other land-related income, with some getting only a few pennies. In contrast, huge corporations such as, one of our favorite, Coke Industries, Walmart, Dollar General, and many more made well over $5 billion from the resources extracted from native land. There's a disparity there. Yeah. Just, just, just like... Just, it's just being facilitated by our government. Yes. They're going yeah. through proper channels. Yeah, the heart, The thing that gets me is that the, the continuing on the next one, mm -hmm. which I love this sentence, so I don't love it, it but it points out the, the fact. Leona Gopher says that people will sign for food or gas money, partly due to the fact that the Bureau of Indian Affairs will deliberately keep natives from knowing what their land is actually worth. It's the best money, uh, the best government that money can buy. All the freedom you can eat. Yeah. Uh, Gover said that an oil company had once made her an offer, and the BIA had told her to file a Freedom of Information Act request to discover the true value of her land. This process took over five years and threatened to cost her up to $3,000 before the Interior Board of Indian Appeals ordered the BIA to complete the record. Because that's the thing that gets me, is they required her and to basically demanded that she file a Freedom of Information Act where anybody again, anybody who's done anything with land knows, I'm just going to spend $300 and hire this inspector and auditor to come look at the land, see the surveying, mm -hmm. and within a month at most, I'll know what this land is roughly worth. Yeah. <clears throat> and the BIA's official stance is that native landowners do not need to use FOIA, FOIA requests uh, to find out what their their own trust data or information is. So essentially we need to fire on. most of the mm -hmm. people in the BIA and repopulate by people who actually give a damn about the natives. That would be a great idea. Um, yeah. Maybe populate the Bureau of Indian Affairs with, oh, I don't know, natives. Well, look, you'll help solve some of the um, unemployment issue. I'm I'm solving problems left and right. Elect me, 2020. Again. By the t by the time she she completed her 
uh, could use her, her completed record to object to the offer, the deal had already moved forward. And the court informed her that she should have just raised her complaints earlier. What? Of course. It's like, um, you, you can't. It's the catch-22. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. You can't raise the complaints without the information. Mm-hmm. But you only get the information after the complaint-raising timeline has passed. Right, and, and the thing is, for a person, it, it gets back to the poor versus the wealthy thing, the, the yeah. wealth disparity thing. So a company that has plenty of money for lawyers and, and all the legal action that they, they can use, they can just bulldoze right over you with that money. Because you simply do not have enough money to put up any reasonable fight whatsoever. And the only place that you can is in the court of public opinion. Hence why we now have a big kerfuffle over the whole Dakota pipeline. Mm -hmm. And now all of this is continuing to come out. I mean, this is the information age. This is a good thing that we're hearing about it, that we're actually being able to talk about it at, at all. I'm, I'm glad, again, I think it started somewhat a little bit in, you saw a little bit in Australia, you saw it uh, much with Canada, with the Canadian First Nations, now yeah. we're seeing it really here, and we're starting to see it take hold, and I'm glad to see it's becoming more in the popular, you know, woke zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, going further on the idea of how much money the people are getting screwed out of, uh, yeah, tribal member... member Eloise Coble became the lead plaintiff in a 13-year lawsuit. Let that sink in. A lawsuit that took 13 years. That revealed startlingly inaccurate records for over a century's worth of disbursements to which Native people were entitled. It was also discovered that the Navajos were getting about $24 to $40 per rod, which is 16 and a half feet, for rights of way on Bureau of Indian Affairs managed trust land. Similar land deals that took place off the reservation earned two hundred and forty to four hundred dollars per rod. A decimal plate di- place difference. Yeah, a literal decimal plate, ten times the amount. And this is why dark money needs to be out of politics. One of dozens of reasons that we've come up with. This, this right here, I, I, I was. I, I previewed most of the stuff, and there was stuff that, you know, it irked me. Mm-hmm. I'm angry. People wonder why I have a real problem with unbridled capitalism. This may- <laughs> Dan, your, your connection's breaking up again. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Um, nope, it's not us. <laughs> so it's just me and my headset. Yeah. Well, no, 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 it's not your headset. Your internet connection is flaking. You're freezing. Which is weird, because yeah. we're both on the same connection. That is weird. Are you on wireless? No. Well, I'm not. I am. Aha! That's what it is. You're on wireless. Okay. Well, we know now. Okay. Yeah, see, um, it's stuff like this that makes me really angry about yeah. the reason why I'm against, you know, unbridled capitalism, because this is what it causes. It's, do you have enough money to deal with us? Yes. No? Get the fuck out of my way. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the, this is the invisible hand taking action on... All commerce, right? For anyone who is a major proponent of laissez-faire, the laissez-faire market, laissez-faire capitalism, this is it. This is it, and this is how it absolutely screws the people. I want your land. You're not willing to sell? Don't care. I'll get a court injunction that says you have to sell to me for whatever I say it's worth. Just imagine laissez-faire fully implemented in the medical industry. They're trying. Then you've got death penals. Then you have the death panels they warned you about. Yeah, the bad death panels, not yeah. the death panels. Yeah, the, it's going to cost more than $300 this year. Yeah, ask them. Your money or your life. How many times? I'm, I'm going to end up saying that every episode, I think, for, Probably for a, a while. long year. time. Yeah. Long time. <sighs> sad. Sad, sad, sad. So, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got these articles and more, including the, uh, the latest... Um, Obama administration reports, you know, the the orders to to stop, which, you know, we read most of that that press release. Uh, But, of course, they have their own spins to put on it and everything as well. Um, So a federal judge Friday denied the tribe's request to halt construction on the 1,000... The Obama administration said it would not authorize construction on a critical stretch of the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
handing a significant victory to the Indian tribe fighting the project the same day the group lost a court battle. The administration said construction would halt until it can do more environmental assessments. Agencies will now decide whether they need to reconsider permitting decisions for the pipeline under the National Environmental Policy Act. Federal Judge Friday denied the tribe's request to halt construction on the 1,170-mile pipeline. The administration's decision came shortly after that decision. Okay, that's interesting. So, uh, guys, I know that you're not hearing the, the videos as they, as they come up like Actually, that. Actually, I did. You did? I oh, did. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, then. <laughs> oh, look, things work. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Okay, cool. It worked. But for those people wondering why... I, from my perspective, why we didn't cover this like in the previous weeks that this has been going on. We didn't know It's enough. because we were waiting for something like this. We were waiting for it to come to a head, either one direction or the other, so we could go either, oh, God, look what's happening and all the horrific things, or, oh, look, somebody's standing up and being smart and possibly de-escalating things. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we got the good one of this. So. No, it's, it's interesting that the federal judge was going against the tribe, mm -hmm. and then the Obama administration said... No, 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 guys, no. no. Actually, so, this is not surprising to me. Well, no, but, but what's surprising is that what we have is we have the executive branch working against the judicial branch. So then we need, of course, the legislative branch to come in, come in and, and fix, fix it. it. So that's why in that press release it says very specifically, hey, Congress needs to fix this. Yeah. So, it's, it's all part of her, the checks and balances of everything. Yep. For everyone yeah. who thinks of Obama as a dictator, let the constitutional law scholar teach you yeah. <laughs> how the executive branch gets things done. Yeah, really what he did was he basically, <laughs> he, he, he just put he a stay of execution the hand of the third on it. Party. He put a stay of execution on it. Yeah. It's like, no, you... It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you said that you could do it, but I'm going to say, no, you need to hold off, which will then, of course, trigger another sighting of then now it's got to go and, and get worked on. So, yeah, fun stuff. But since um, I don't think that the Army Corps of Engineers, being part of the military, and he's the commander-in-chief of the military can go against the thing that he tells them to do. Nope. So, if he says... Nope, don't halt it. If he says, no, don't do it, then they have to, no, don't do it. <laughs> because the mm -hmm. contractor is working off the premise that it's Army Corps land. Right. So the Army Corps says, stop. You say you for how long? <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, it's an interesting battle that we have here. It's very interesting as, as we continue to, to dive into it. But I think that uh, we've got plenty of other stories, and you can dive into it along with us, and, uh, and we will, we'll keep a look on it. Cause For you wonderful it's man interesting. to cover this, I hope you are now well-informed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, moving along to something that we teased a little bit in the history segment of show A, uh, this week may see the largest prison strike in U.S. history. Across 24 states, inmates are sick of poisoned water, solitary confinement, and forced labor. Shocking. Of course, they're prisoners. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, this September 9th, we may witness the largest prison strike. Uh, potentially thousands of inmates across both state and federal prisons in as many as 24 states plan to engage in a coordinated strike and protest in an attempt to bring attention to the daily injustice in their lives. The strike's... The strikers are call, calling for an end to slave-like working conditions, illegal reprisals, and inhuman, inhumane living conditions. Planned for the 45th anniversary of the Attica Prison Uprising, the actions of September 9th will shed light on the often decrepit conditions suffered by 2.4 million people. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. 2.4 million people in what is the largest carceral system in the world. They, are also, they will also mark a new point in the fight against mass incarceration and likely stand as a harbinger for further actions and strikes to come. Did you guys hear anything else about this today? No. Um, in, in, in 
in following it, um, if you want to really dive deeper into this, um, the folks that are following it are the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center. Surprise, surprise. Yep. Um, and again, this is supposed to be a peaceful protest, which is being organized, mm-hmm. uh, where they're just they're not going to work. They I are. Think- they're, again, yeah. the prison labor system, especially in a lot of our state prisons, which are for-profit prisons, use the inmates as labor. Uh, and a lot of times, if they get any pay at all, it's pittance on the dollar. Because uh, while they're inmates, they're no longer U.S. citizens. So they're not protected under the law when yeah. it comes to that form of trade. Labor, law. or co- labor laws or commerce. So, yeah, they're essentially slave labor. The general public has little idea of the scope of prison labor, considering how pervasive it is. Most prisons force inmates to perform the basic facility maintenance, mopping floors, cutting grass, cooking, or washing clothes. That keeps the prison running. Inmate author and longtime prisoner rights activist Rashid Johnson describes the entire Texas prison system as dependent upon its prisoner labor with the prisoners literally performing every job short of running the cell block. A number of states and federally run prisons often use inmate labor to manufacture marketable goods and services. Some of this labor is outsourced by private corporations, including Walmart, McDonald's, Victoria's Secret, Nordstrom's, AT&T Wireless, just to name a few recognizable brands. You know, looking at uh, one that came out about uh, less than 12 hours ago, actually, mm-hmm. um, from CBS News. I just linked it in the, in the show notes. Yeah, pay within prisons ranges from as low as roughly 15 cents an hour up to the federal minimum wage of seven twenty five an hour, although about half that pay is deducted before prisoners see it. Most jobs are low-paid positions that keep the prisons running, the higher-paid ones are outsourced from private corporations such as prisoners sewing lingerie for Victoria's Secret and are sought after by inmates, Feynman noted. Mm-hmm. Some states provide no guarantee of pay for prisoners. The minimum wage for Georgia and Texas prisoners is zero. Wow. Minimum wage of zero is not a wage. Yeah. Yeah. Again, how we handle prisoners in this country is vastly different than the rest of the first world nations on our little rock. Here's where it stands right there. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's that. We're looking at how prison labor is treated. You literally go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution era where, again, if you won't perform well enough, you might be beaten yeah. by the staff or punished in various ways because you're not performing up to standards. Overseers watch over our every move, and if we do not perform our appointed tasks to their liking, we are punished, said statement from the Incarcerated Workers Organization Committee. Quote, they, have many re- they, have re- they may have replaced the whip with pepper spray, but many of the other torments remain. Isolation, restraint positions, stripping off our clothes, and investigating our bodies as though we are animals. Uh, Americans are increasingly aware of prison conditions, thanks to shows like Orange is the New Black. At the same time, the prison population has surged during the past several decades. That's the why incarceration I like rate... idea. If you, treat a per- if you treat a prisoner like an animal, That's do not be surprised when they come out an animal. Yeah. The incarceration rate has surged fourfold since the mid-20th century, according to The Growth of Incarceration in the United States, a book published by the National Academies Press. With more people behind bars, it's increasingly likely that Americans know someone, a friend, a colleague, a family member, who has served time in prison. Yep. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, and the problem is, once you've, once you've got that on record, it's really difficult to obtain gainful employment afterwards. Nobody wants to hire you. Yeah, it's also hard to get your voting rights reinstated. Any of your rights, depending on the infraction. It, oh, sometimes it, sometimes so. it's just, are you a felon? You're no, done. Yeah, yeah, you're just done. 
So it, it's it's crazy, um, and it doesn't get enough press. No, no, because it's, well, it's not two point four million white people. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, speaking of white people and crime, <laughs> let's talk about the uh, Clintons' boring email scandal. Yep. Yeah. Okay, who put this It on? continues. Who put this I, in the show notes? I, I threw that one in there just because there was right. a new one. September 7th, 2016. It's like, yeah, okay, okay well, there's more. There's, then there's more stuff that people are still talking about. Take it on. <laughs> I'm going yeah, to mute, no, so. mute myself and eat some cookies. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, so just to... I'll just read the first paragraph because that pretty much sums up all you need to know. Last week, the State Department announced that it had examined 15,000 Hillary Clinton emails that the former secretary had not turned over, but which the FBI had found in the course of its investigation into her use of private email server on an account. Of those, perhaps 30 were related to September 11, 2012 terror attacks in Benghazi. After years of investigations, might these finally offer some fresh revelations about the attack? No. <laughs> uh... There were only three new emails, with the rest being duplicates. Of those three, two were simply forwarded copies of messages that had already been sent, including a memo from Clinton to the whole department. And the third was a January 2013 note from the U.S. ambassador to Brazil congratulating Clinton on her performance during testimony before Congress about the attacks. So, wait, 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 wait a second here. Okay. So, the State Department somehow got 15,000 new, I'm bunny-earing new, emails Yep. that the FBI had uncovered. Yeah. And of those, there were how many non-duplicated emails? Three? Three. So they did not find 15,000 undeclared emails. They found yeah. three. So people out there who scream about the clickbait, oh, look, all the emails were found. No, three. Three that mattered. They found three. Except they didn't matter. Yep. And they were irrelevant. Yeah, three that were relevant-ish. <sighs> okay. We can move on now. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty much all there is to say. That's just... It's like, there's, wow. no, there's no smoke here. It's like... The the investigation, as I understand it, was because the, there was a belief structure that she was directly responsible for the deaths of those four men. She was not. No. There was, there, two of them died in a mortar attack. I think one of yeah. them died, or the other two, I think, died in fire. Yeah, I think so. But again, a lot of it can be blamed on the GOP removing funding for security. Which she did request. Yeah. So for that one particular one in case. Yeah, because they knew that it was getting hot. Because she had the intelligence. Okay, moving right along. Hi That's really nice. radio listeners. This is your host Andy Cowan calling my voicemail to make sure that it still works. Please consider calling us 470-222-6759. And now we're into... It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. The Tesla Model 3. Do we oh, need to say more than that? This thing's beautiful. <laughs> it's just a good idea, right? <laughs> a, a good idea for it to be lower so I can afford it? Oh, yeah, yeah. It'll get there. Can I get There's... a Tesla crotch rocket bike or a cruiser? I'd be fine with that. I'm, I'm sure they're coming. Eventually, so, the Tesla midlife crisis. Yeah, they're, they're coming out with that double line. <laughs> no, they've already got the Tesla midlife, midlife crisis. That that's was, the, that's, that's the, the model. model too. That's the Roadster. Yeah, yeah that's the oh, Roadster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this came out on September 2nd. So we're a little, little late on it. A little, little late. behind. Um, it's only had part one of its reveal, but here's what we know about the company's most affordable electric vehicle yet. Um. So what what rang your bell? What rang your bell, David? Model 3. Like I said, do we need to say more? 
It's like, do we need to say more than, hey, Model 3, that, that's a good idea? Oh, no, come on, come this, on. This, you know, it, it puts it down in a price point that it's going to be realistic for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, not everybody, but it's half the minimum $70,000 you're going to pay on a Model S. So $35,000 for a nice vehicle, that's not out of range for uh, middle income. Middle management on up, you can afford one. Oh, yeah. But what yeah. I love is the fact of, from what here, the fact that it's already been a big hit with potential, potential buyers with 400,000 having been placed on deposit. Show me another vehicle that was produced in the world that has, before it has even been made, 400,000 orders. That's yeah. not a military vehicle. Now, now, these are not full orders. You can reserve a space with as little as $1,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're reserving a place in line to get, get one. one. You then, of course, would have to you know, pay the rest of the money. Yeah. Um, but you have one on reserve as soon as it comes off the line. I'm, I live in a smaller place. I don't care. <laughs> it's it's going to be interesting. Of course, you'll have to figure out a place to park your nice, uh, your nice electric vehicle. Uh, okay, so... Why should why should we continue to talk about it though? That's the thing. Why why is this Because this might be deal? the the thing that moves us forward towards alternative fuels for vehicles. Yep, this is going to drive solar panel technology. This is going to drive alternative energy sources, uh renew the quest for fusion power, all that sort of thing. Um this is to to finally change our roads over from internal combustion engines mm-hmm. to electric motors. Oh my god. Just think about what this will do for the noise level alone inside of cities. From a or, business perspective, go ahead. From a business perspective, I also love the fact that it's you know, as a their Tesla's master plan is we build this vehicle. Okay. Now we're gonna use the profit we make from that vehicle. To then build this one, which costs less. And then we're going to use a problem made from that one to build this one, which costs less. And they just keep doing that. We're going, oh, look, a company that knows what it's doing. It doesn't just go, hi, I want all the money for all the money. It's the, no, I'm going to take the money and immediately reinvest it to make it so more people can buy my stuff. Yeah. Breed, Breed brand loyalty and grow your brand. Yeah. In a 1950s standpoint, oh, look, here's a company which would not be paying the 90% tax rate because they're reinvesting directly in the company. That's true. Go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Musk has tweeted that the Model 3 will feel like a spaceship on the inside. <laughs> yes. Yes, it will. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the whole thing will. Again, um, this also drives more competition into a... a st- dulled vehicular market, especially here in the States. Oh, yeah. This this puts some new energy forward. And if this does well, if this is affordable, if this is an, an excellent alternative option, then other companies will see investing in alternate energy sources. Well, this is... I want to say the Model 3 is kind of the beginning of the end of mainstream internal combustion engines. For the simple fact of the matter is there's almost nothing to break on this car except the electronics, which are infinitely replaceable. And upgradable. And upgradable. So electric motor, that thing will, electric motor will keep on going and <clears throat> going and going. It also is going to have the... Um, driver assist features, as I would like to call them, as opposed to the autopilot feature, which is what Tesla is calling them. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it's, it, you're cr- more correct. It's, it's driver assist, because you need to stay aware. But they are, they are trying to move towards autopilot. It's basically trying to move yeah. us into the world that you saw in Minority Report, where the ve- you get in a vehicle, it drives you to a location, you get out of the vehicle. It or might not even be yours. Yeah, well, that's that's already part of his plan. We've been over the yeah. you know the the master plan part two. His words, 
His words, specifically. No, we literally put this on our website five years ago. It's still there. You can look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why are you people surprised? Uh, I told you this already. It's, it's right here. Yeah. yeah. Here, here's my evil mastermind plan. Hi, Maybe. I'm Tony Stark. This is my plan. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I am Iron Man. You might as well have said that. <laughs> no, no. See, on, on the website. One, two more generations of vehicles down. He'll finally have enough money to make his Tesla man armor. <laughs> Well, you never know with the with the advent of the EM drive. Yep, the EM we drive might for see a Tesla rocket. Well, we are. It's called SpaceX. Um, that's true. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yes. no, 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 David, electric powered uh, rocket engine. David, he got you. He got yeah. you on that one. <laughs> he did. Um, the other thing this does is, um, if this is successful. There are going to be companies that are looking to invest in quick charge technology, charging stations, because that's been the biggest hurdle here in the States is, hey, I'm building this alternative fuel vehicle. How are you going to refuel it? So the Model 3 will be capable of at least 215 miles on a single charge. And that minimum is supposed to be with a battery that's smaller than the other cars. At 60 kilowatt hours. Um, and of course, this entire time, they're continuing to put out more of the um, charging stations. And remember also part of his master plan, he open sourced the charger technology, hoping that other people would simply use it and, and make it happen elsewhere, like, well, a, like a gas station. Yep, yeah, it'll eventually behoove the mm -hmm. gas stations to start including electric recharge stations. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that happened during Jeb Bush's tenure as governor was a push to actually install not just electrical charge stations, but also hydrogen stations throughout the state. He was actually pushing for that, and then con the, our, our, our state's Congress blocked him. Yeah. One of the few good things I can say about him. Yeah. 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 Um, so... It may come in a dual motor, which would be a four-wheel drive model. Um, in addition, there, there, so there might be a two-wheel drive and a four-wheel drive model. The yep. four-wheel drive, unlike in standard cars, uh, the four-wheel drive would actually be more efficient. Yeah, it actually <laughs> improves your range. Yeah, it would be more efficient because it's using you know two motors to do it, uh, and it would be significantly faster as well because you're putting you know, twice the torque down to the road. Um, so. You know, I like the fact it shows here that while the performance specs are being kept very close to the vest, uh, AliExpress has been on a ride in one that says it will do 0 to 62 in less than 6 seconds. Whew. It's good. It's good. That'll get you up to highway speeds. Yeah. Almost, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, while range topping all wheel drive variants should manage a 4.5 seconds to yep. 60. Yeah. Pretty close to McLaren F1 speed. Uh, it has been I confirmed that Ludicrous Mode Model 3 will be available. The extra power is a 8,000 uh, pound option. In um, which case, you basically have the equivalent of a Mazda 3 that's faster on the line. I am than a waiting for to get this. To get the yeah. Lucas model and actually go out and drag race somebody and win. Yeah, yeah. I was well, videos go. of it in the Model S, taking on Dodge Vipers and everything else, just gone. Interesting. So there's there's a thing here called supercharger credits. Uh, at the car's reveal, Musk said owners would get access to the stations. Okay, so we're talking about the charging stations now. Yep. Uh, Tesla has a growing network of supercharger stations dotted around key routes in the U.S. and Europe to allow its drivers to quick uh, drivers quick and free top ups on the go, and they're crucial to making long all electric journeys a realistic proposition. Uh, at the car's reveal, Musk said owners would get access to the station uh, access to the stations. At first, it appeared they would be offered free charging. However, he has since said it won't be thrown in as standard. Uh, and many now believe 
specking it could be one of the car's most expensive options, coming in at around uh, 2,500 pounds. So that's like a $5,000. It's e like easily a $5,000 option. Uh, made in a one-off payment, uh, either when buying the car or through a software upgrade further down the line. A software upgrade. So you can... Huh. When you plug in the what? car, it probably identifies itself to the charge station. Interesting. Which leads me to believe that at some point somebody's going to hack their car to make it look like another car so they get free charging. Well, that that's going to be the new fraud. That might be hard, but yeah. Um, however, a new report in Electric uh, suggests that there may be a second way to enable the feature supercharger credits. So they, these would be the credits that, you know, the supercharger stations, in order to use them, you'd have to have access to it. Otherwise, it simply wouldn't work. Probably just do a card on yeah. file type of thing. Yeah, something like that. Uh, Model 3 owners could be offered a pay-as-you-go subscription to the stations. Yeah, that's going to happen. That's, yeah. sim that's simply going to happen. You know, basically um, as, you go, as it works now with gasoline, let's be honest. Yeah. Well, I, I think I've seen, I've seen charger stations for, like, the Nissan Leaf and things like that. Yeah. And, and those, there's a credit card swipe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you log into that, and it tells you how much power you've consumed, and you pay for it. I mean, it's not free, and it shouldn't be free, I don't think. That makes sense. No, the, the, the energy is being produced somewhere, yeah. but it is vastly cheaper than a per-gallon cost. Yeah. Now, however, if it is a one-time fee, Model 3 owners could, could be offered a pay-as-you-go, um, allowing them to open an account and simply pay per kilowatt hour they need rather than for lifetime access. But so if you could make that one-time payment. If you can make the one-time payment, you just <laughs> plug in and it's free. Yeah. From there. Oh. I'm good from here on out. Let's go. Yeah, that that's alluring. I would that's expect that out. Loan. That's alluring. Because power, what they're count, counting on with this is that power rates are not going to go up. Yeah. That whatever they're doing will bring their overall cost per kilowatt down. Well, this would make it, you know, advantageous for solar, you know, charging station, gas stations. Yeah. To mm -hmm. all their roofs, those huge overhangs you see at like racetracks and such. They got to produce, it produce their own power. Yeah. So if they produce their own power with the and they could do it if you've bought it up front like that, you know, it's just like a prepay option. <clears throat> Then they've got the capital yeah. to just dump into it. Yeah. Also, I mean, there's other ways you can do it. If you're in, you know, say the Midwest, mm -hmm. you can use those um, turbineless wind power stations. I love those you things. Can, we need more of you them. Can, yeah. You can put them on top of your building. Like the wiggle ones? Yeah. Yeah, yeah the wiggle and ones. More importantly, that doesn't like, you know, murder flocks of birds. <laughs> Yeah. Do, 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 wiggle, but wiggle, could, wiggle. <laughs> but you could install those and just be generating the power on site. Mm -hmm. Or also, think about just being out on the beach and, you know, anybody's been out there, it's almost like constant wind. And they've shown it actually doesn't take much for those things to wiggle and generate power. Guys. Mm -hmm. Imagine those on the buildings. Look what I had. Or it. just off sore. Or the... um. That new, there's a new uh, solar panel design. I don't know if you guys saw this. It was like 20 times the amount of power. Tw wait, of 20 times? 20 times. Okay, you look that up, and I'm going to say this. The company plans to scale up production to 500,000 cars a year by 2018. <sighs> and according to CNET, uh, they believe it can make between 100,000 and 200,000 Model 3s in 2017. Come on, lottery. Come on, lottery. Give me my money. That's. But also think about not it. Not bad. With that many cars being produced, they're going to keep the cost mm -hmm. down. You have to in order to sell. You know, I've I've been around the around the the state a lot, and around the country. You know, in in, in other times, and I have seen quite a few Teslas. Mm-hmm. 
Tesla has built and sold around 140,000 cars. The the bottom line is their cars will stay on the road longer. Yeah. Because the only thing that really wears out is the battery. And we're making the thing better that, batteries. And the brakes. We're making better batteries. The brakes, you can, you it's the same as anything else. You well, just actually, replace the brakes. Actually, th- think but, about it. You're actually the, doing the, better As far with as the major things that would break, it's the battery. It's your gas tank, essentially, in the Tesla, which is replaceable. Yeah. Also, with brakes, remember you're using the electric motor also as a brake for regenerative charging. Yep. So every time you're stopping, you're actually forcing more power into your batteries. <laughs> Again, that's the thing that gets me is when it comes to this is I will be more than happy to Tesla. If it yeah. kills most of the probable mechanic bills, I will pay on a vehicle. Oh, almost all of them will be gone. Yeah. And just think about there's no more once a month or once every couple of months replacing all the oil in your system. Yeah, there's no oil. There's no more transmission fluid to change. Yeah. If you think about the amount of it's lo- the it's reduction it's in the amount less, of oil, of less gold, moving parts. It's simply less moving parts. Yeah, the the reduction in the amount of oil usage alone is staggering, staggering. Hmm. Less moving and parts. Less then failure. you think about the noise pollution. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, and a reduction of carbon footprint? Yeah. There's electric cars are simply a good idea and they're do, they're doing it right by having an overall kind of holistic approach to it, you know, with uh, the solar city expansion, the mm-hmm. Tesla Powerwall, the battery, the Gigafactory, the the entire plan for Part D and and all the everything they're doing is being done well, it's keeping public oh, interest it's executed up. Executed flawlessly. Yeah. There's a Tesla Model X driving around in my area. I've seen it twice. Have you been tempted to GTA the, the vehicle? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. At least you're honest. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, no Grand Theft Auto around here. Okay. We, we don't recommend it. No, like no. I don't recommend it because that that will only get me a short amount of time with the Model X, and I want to en- long... enjoy the temptation. Don't actually do it. Okay. So no, sen- no, no, no. since you since you mentioned the solar panels and you got them right here, we'll just jump jump straight to that so that we're we're continuing uh, in that trend. Oh, okay. So they're three D solar panels. They are three D solar panels. Okay. So it's so just, it's, it's fitting it's, twenty times more surface area into the same space. Yep, is what it's doing. So that's you get, cool. You get the same efficiency per voltaic. You're just putting more of them into the same area so that you can collect more. Okay. You know, drawing collect in, more is yeah. collect more. Yeah, drawing in twenty times more power per square foot. Yeah, it's per square foot. So the voltaic itself isn't more efficient. But the layout is a, is a much better idea. Precisely. Yeah, it I, works. Let's go for it. Let's I remember, it. Uh, I think, geez, must have been like four years ago. I think we were playing a game, David, and we were talking about solar panels and like arranging them like in a pyramid or something on on a lattice and things like that to collect sun from all angles. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same principle. This same, is it. Same principle, yeah. Implemented. Yeah, they've been listening. I've been listening. <laughs> but you imagine this 20 times the power per square foot. It's easy to just pile these things into locations now. You need 1 20th the, uh, the land area. Or you can just double down and well, yeah, use that much more and get more power. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I don't know that this is necessarily as efficient. I mean, they, they say that it is, but, and I have to kind of trust the people at MIT. It's you know, space efficiency. They're, say. they're smart folks. But yeah, I mean, you need the solar panel to be in as direct light as possible. Mm-hmm. And by making it vertical, which is what these are doing, to get the per square foot, you know, rate up that high, you're creating shadows. Right. So there's going to be some of those voltaics that are then shading other voltaics 
Depends on how you arrange them. It does. It does depend on that. Spacing and arrangement matter. But, and also uh, but where just you looking are. at looking at the way they have these on just cubes, that mm -hmm. looks a lot like just the arrangement that they're wanting to do. And that doesn't. Uh, I can see flaws with that right now. You know, all you have to do is just. Where's the sun? It's directly above it. Well, that's a problem for everything that's below the very top one. Easily solvable with mirrors. Or if it's but if you have mirrors with a slanted roof. Yeah, but then you're putting it at an angle, and if you add mirrors, then you're adding surface area required for the generation. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll obviously we're going to keep a look on this because we wait. love it. I have an idea with this. Okay. Okay. So with with these, yeah. Um. You can, because just look at how small they are in width. Yeah. Now, install that alongside your window pane, vertically, built into the wall. Yeah. So you can put these along the sides of buildings and wire it directly into the building. Mm -hmm. And it looks cool. It does. So you can, instead of having to put this stuff on the roof, you can put these along the walls of your house. I think the important thing with the design, how they're doing it, is the sentence in the second paragraph. The panels were tested during both cloudy and sunny conditions and proved to perform consistently despite the weather changes. That's huge. Uh-huh. Huh. Seems weird, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Huh. yeah I'd, I'd want to see more about this. I want to see where this goes. Yeah. Because this was in... This is from a while ago, actually. Mm-hmm. So we have to see where it's gone since. Yeah, this is from 2012. Yeah. Hey, four years ago. That's what we were talking about. Maybe, maybe this is might, just a holdover from that. Okay. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll we'll take a, a further look at that. That's that's something interesting. Of course, obviously interesting. So, um, interesting thing about uh, about Mexico. Oh yeah. Mexico senator proposes taking back land from the U.S. if Donald Trump becomes president. So. So get this. <laughs> this is how World War III started. Mexico is to consider a proposal to revoke its treaties with the U.S., including the 1848 agreement that transferred half of its territory to Washington if Donald Trump is elected and tries to make the U.S. southern neighbor pay for the border wall. I approve of this. Yeah. That's a bit of a deterrent. No. Be interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anything's going to come of this, but this would this would be war. It really would. Mm -hmm. Well, going down, I love his actual quote: "In cases where the property or assets of our fellow citizens or companies are affected by a foreign government, as Donald Trump has threatened, the Mexican government should proportionally expatriate assets and properties of foreigners from that country on our territory." Wow. Total remittance of Mexico from abroad, most of which comes from the United States, uh, were worth nearly $25 billion. Did I lose the call? No, I've got you guys. No. Okay, Dan. No, Dan we got, lost Dan. Yeah, Dan got lost. Uh, I hear you guys, but it just dropped me because Skype is nasty. Skype, uh, Skype no like you. Skype no likey the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi. No oh. likey the Wi-Fi. Um, We're looking at getting a cord next time. <laughs> yeah, it's always a good idea. If you're or gonna, sometime soon. If you're going to do a podcast and you got to have the bandwidth, just do wired. Just do wired, guys. Okay. So, yeah, um, I don't think anything's going to come of this because I'm I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that uh, that Donald never makes it into the White House. 
Except I think this is more just you're really going to try to do this stupid thing and you're, you're making your point on this. All right, well, fine, we'll do the same. Yeah. And because they're pointing out the absurd, the political absurdity of what he's saying exactly. and hoping it gets through to some people who haven't realized yet, oh, wait, you know, like some of the people in the Mexican territories, such as Arizona, Mexico, California. California. Um, and this is how World War Three started. <laughs> with Mexico. <laughs> yeah. They're going to annex Texas. Yep. Oh, that would be so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> remember the Alamo, and there's Mexico going. Oh, we remember. We it. remember. We know right where it is. <laughs> and we we do not like when you're done with it. Yeah, we burned. We let that you have the place for 160 years, and look what you've done with it. Nope, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, we like what you've done with California. That's uh, all the tech sector and all that. Yeah, we like that. That's good stuff. <laughs> we'll take all that. And speaking of the tech sector. ITT Technical Institute <laughs> decided to shutter themselves to close down after being in business for 50 years. So they, they were a, a nationwide um, private college. Uh, more like a technical school, really. Yeah. Yeah, they were a for-profit tech. Mm -hmm. uh, so 40,000 students are affected here. Uh <laughs> so students, teachers, and faculty, they were all shocked Tuesday to find out that ITT Technical Institute was immediately shutting down its campuses nationwide. In response, some ITT Tech employees have filed a lawsuit against the company, saying that uh, they should have had some more notice. Under federal law, the company should have given employees a 60-day notice before the mass shutdown, the suit alleges. Uh, the, the closure comes after an August 25th order from the U.S. Department of Education barring the school from enrolling students receiving federal financial aid. The move would have required ITT Tech to post a letter of credit or make a cash deposit in the amount of $250 million, uh, the company announced in its letter to students. Nursing student Antoinette Pierce uh, couldn't believe she wouldn't continue her education at ITT Tech. Why weren't we told? I feel like I was misled. That's because you were. I feel defrauded because you were. I feel betrayed. You, you know were. what? You were. <laughs> you know, I had all my hopes on this school. Yeah, we know. I depend on them to get me through this program. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Know. And they're that's gone. What, that's one thing I will say, because I've actually had friends who went through ITT Tech, and mm -hmm. yeah, some of their courses, everything else, he actually went through the photonics course and all that fun stuff. Okay. Um, he learned some good things. Yeah. But again, the major thing I've learned about ITT Tech was the contacts and networks they had. If you wanted to work in any defense contractor, uh, you went through ITT Tech because, my God, they were lining up to hire people from there. Yeah. Their job placement was good. Oh, yeah. I will definitely say that. Um, now, the Department of Education also put a freeze on the receipt of all Pell Grants and student loans. ITT Tech is uh, closing all campuses nationwide effective immediately after August 25th, uh, after the August 25th order from the U.S. Department. Um, oh, I just read that. Wow. Why, why did it roll down? No, it was, it was in there twice. Okay. Fun. Good is that important? They have to put Good it editing. Twice. Good editing, WFTV Channel 9, ABC, Orlando affiliate. <laughs> I'm going to call you out directly. So, um, yeah, it's... I, I thought about going there once. To one of the uh, one of the campuses in the Orlando area, so uh, one one of their one hundred and thirty campuses in thirty eight states, I might add, um, and I uh, I was a, a bit put off by it because I was already in the uh, information technology industry, and they were asking you know you know what I had done and history and things like that you know as proper placement kind of people would do. And they were really excited by my experience because I would be giving that experience to other people in class. Um, I'm not the teacher. You're not hiring me for a teacher. I'm coming here as a student, which means I pay you. So that was a red flag. Uh, the, second, uh, the second red flag was that due to my advanced experience, I would be able to test out of most of the courses, but I would, of course, still have to pay full. For every credit hour, even and though I, that, even that's though I, a, that's a red flag. Yeah, even though I didn't have to actually attend the class at all. 
Um, yeah, yeah so if it's you clip cool. out of a course, you shouldn't have to pay for the course. Yeah. That would, you'd think that. Or at least at a discounted rate of some type. You know? But no. The background it, noise is drowning you out, Andy. And it's you again. It came on suddenly. Uh, let's see. Dan, mute your mic. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, I think Audio, that, I, issues, gotta love them. I think that Skype is trying to automatically regulate your volume. You may need to go into the control panel in Skype and uncheck the box that says automatically adjust volume. Do that stuff manually, and you'll be much more consistent. Um, I had to do that here, too, and everything's been much better on, on my end for everything else coming through. Tools, options, audio settings. Yes. So We need a program that doesn't try to do these handy things. They're, they're trying to help you. Yeah, I know. We, we had one. They, the more they ways. try to help, the worse it gets over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much true. Um, we're definitely giving it a workout here. But you know what? It's free. Yeah, there's that. I cannot really complain that much okay. about free. Am I within compliance? It's better. Yeah, it's it's better. much better. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Yeah, there, there were a lot of red flags there. Uh, but this kind of red flag, it, it takes me back to some of the, uh, the charter school discussions that we've had. The, you know, again, the private school that isn't compliant with things, and as soon as they get a letter to get into compliance, they just shut down. Yep. yep. They take the money and run, and that's that. And here we are. Yeah. So everybody's left out in the cold, all the teachers, all the students. So where'd the money go? It went, went to the executive board. The board of directors right. is bad. I, I would like to follow the money on this, but I don't know the trail yet. Yeah. Uh, so if you happen to be a student at ITT Tech, um, there is an, a nice article here of, you know, what's your, what's your next steps and things like that. Uh, how, how would you possibly obtain any <laughs> of your information? Uh, apparently there are links you know what? I'm not seeing. I'm, I can't click on any of the links that they say there are links here. Uh, by no, clicking I'm, on this link. No. <laughs> Thank you, WFTV Channel Nine, ABC, or yeah. affiliate. <laughs> Do it again. Yeah, uh, showing. It, click this link here. Yeah. And you, there's no you may, link. You may request a copy of your official transcript via the student portal by clicking this link. There's no link. Uh, no. Please, <laughs> please use your student email and network password to log in. Which, by the way. All of that's going to be shuttered down, too, because all those servers are owned by the, the company, and all of those are going to go away. So dump your email out as quickly as you can if you haven't already. <laughs> um, and as of today, we expect to have all grades for the June 2016 quarter updated by Friday, September 9th, by today. So in theory, you should be able to get into the student portal, and, well, while you're doing that, get everything out. Send everything to yourself. Export all of it. Do something, whatever you can, because all that's gonna, all that's going to go away. It's going to go away so fast. Um, while your campus will be closing immediately at the end of the June quarter, uh, we continue to provide resources to assist you in obtaining your transcript and other records. Please check the student portal by clicking this link. This is cut and paste. Yeah. This yeah. is cut and paste, and they cut and paste in plain text and don't have the hyperlinks where that word link is supposed to be a link. That's what they did. You idiots. Okay. If you're willing to pay me more than $10 an hour, I'll work for you to fix this kind of crap. Just, yeah, no, just throwing it out there. Yeah, no kidding. Anyway, uh, go out to www.itt-tech.edu and do what you can. Good luck. Tell them how much you hate them right now. Yeah. They um, don't care. They have the money. Will I have to repay my student loans? It may be possible for you to discharge your federal student loans 
and not have to repay them under certain circumstances. For more information about this, click this invisible link here. <laughs> In our article that I saw, if uh, you were only enrolled for the past six months, uh, you can have those loans forgiven. But it's only if you were enrolled for the past six months. So yeah, I feel bad for the people who are like one course or two courses away from graduating. Oh yeah, they're screwed. Yeah. Dan, your ears is getting loud again. I don't understand it. I turned it off. It hates us. Mm-hmm. It's been a little... Yeah. <sighs> How's that? Our, our friends that we That's game good. with were having some issues with this the other night we were working on. Yeah, it's it's really it's the automatic settings. I, I don't get it. They, they try really hard to make things louder. Um, okay. We'll work so, on it. Yes, we well, obviously we we're going to continue to work on it. Apparently all the way through the show. Okay. So, enough of uh, enough of ITT tech. I'm I'm very sorry if you went there. Um hopefully any of the contacts that you were able to make uh will will land you sitting pretty at the end. And also, guys, if you hear anything about the defense contractors and where now they're doing their recruiting from, that would be a good thing to know about. I imagine probably uh, the state universities. UCF already had a... The University of Central Florida already has some good connections for that. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, they're one of the major providers. And yeah. Well, here in Florida, that's definitely one of the things. But they're, they were in 38 states. This, yep. is, this was a nationwide disaster. So really unfortunate for the people that were depending on them for if they move to another state, they could then talk to the campus advisors and, and see if they could then do job placement again in the state. Because I know with a lot of these colleges, that's one of the things that they offer alumni always is, you know, more job placement at the end. No matter what. Unless the they rest. go away. Yeah, unless, of course, they just <gasps> whew, vanish. Smoke bomb. Boom. Ninja vanish. Okay. Yep. So now, um, oh yeah, I guess we have, um, hmm. Bad idea. Some bad ideas. Oh, here's, here are the Brussels sprouts, folks. As if we haven't already been eating them. I like Brussels sprouts, so I kind of... I'm growing to like them. This. I'm growing to like them, but that's because I'm getting older, and I think my tastes are just changing. I oh. like them raw. You are a freak. Yep. Yes, yeah, no, so, they've got to be they got to be cooked down to where they're soft, and then yeah. the vinegar and pepper and some salt. Maybe caramelized with a lot of butter. I'm sorry, yeah. I like my miniature cabbages. Yeah, well, that's what they are, um, and they're delicious when dipped. Okay, that's what she said. Moving on, delicious uh, when dipped. I don't, mm, okay, all right. So, hey, yeah, um, <laughs> I guess we'll get into these so that we can wrap, Brussels sprouts. wrap the show up here. So, uh, no pension, no peeps. What is this going on here? Well, the Just Born uh, company, which produces your delicious peeps, um, is trying to screw over its workers. Its workers have declared strike. Oh. So the, 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 little, peeps. the little marshmallow peeps. Yes, the marshmallow peeps. Um, pretty much the company wants to eliminate the workers' pensions force the workers to pay more for their health insurance plans uh, and screw with their wages. Yeah. And the workers Typical. are going, well, we'll meet you halfway on the insurance, but we want to keep our wages and our pensions. And the company goes, nah. So they're striking. Just Born is a privately held family-owned company with sales of $230 million. Uh, originally incorporated in 1923 in the city of New York, uh, Just Born currently operates out of Bethlehem, where it is located, has been located since 1932. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yes, uh, this story is out of Horsham, Pennsylvania. Um, wow. So, four hundred. Local six, the the union uh, members at Just Born, unanimously voted to go on strike after rejecting the company's last offer. 
Four hundred. Four hundred yeah. employees. Four hundred employees that they're trying to jerk around here. Yeah. yeah. In contract negotiations that began in May, proposed eliminating the workers' pension. Wow. Yeah, all the things. Basically, <laughs> we don't want you guys anymore. We want, we want basic employees. We want part timers in here instead. That's basically what I'm getting from all that. So, folks, uh, until you hear our whys, I know there's there's we're getting into the holidays and they do do Halloween peeps. It's true. Don't, don't buy them. Yeah, don't don't buy the Halloween. Just peeps. don't buy them. Um, but what's sad is they also produce other things such as Mike and Ike's. No! Tennessee beanie jelly beans and hot tamales. I'm sorry to say, hot tamales. Hot tamales. They make the Mike and Ikes. Ah, uh, don't, don't eat them. I guess it's on to snow caps for me then. Yeah. Uh, As long as you don't mess with my Reese's cups. No, that that, that that's, no, that's, that's somebody else. Fishy. They do, however, make uh, Goldenberg candy, uh, uh, the Goldenberg peanut chews. They apparently just purchased the Goldenberg Candy Company in in 2003. Uh, Quote, the workers at the the company's Peeps plant had devoted much of their lives to producing these iconic just-born candies, and the company has benefited from their skills and dedication through soaring profits. Workers deserve to be treated fairly with reasonable wage increases and a pension that allows them to retire with dignity. Yes. Yeah. I can't find anything wrong with that sentence. This is literally what people fought and died for. Yeah. We just celebrated <clears throat> Labor Day, folks. Yeah. Everyone at Labor Day was actually about this. the people who died to bring you a 40-hour work week. Yeah. And overtime. And a two-day weekend. <sighs> a weekend. Yeah. Instead of working 14-hour days. Mm-hmm. Hey, there's also a petition, apparently. Not that it's going to make any difference. So there, there's also a hashtag that you can follow, Peeps on Strike. Hashtag Peeps on Strike, if you want more out in the Twitterverse about uh, Peeps and, uh, and their Peeps. The Peeps fighting for more money from the Peeps company. Yep. Fun. Hardcore Peep on Peep action. <sighs> what will I do? I, I usually do Peep jousting in the microwave. <laughs> I've actually never done that, and I need to at some point. No, That's impressive. <laughs> Most impressive. All right. So, um, oh, Wells Fargo. Okay, there's a scandal. What's going on at oh, Wells Fargo? This, this, is, this, is, this is informative. This is a life lesson, folks. Um, Wells, Wells Fargo F- has fired thousands of employees and incurred fines totaling $185 million because of a widespread pa- practice of employees opening new accounts for existing customers without their authorization. Yep. What? They were trying to hit uh, incentives and targets oh, wow. for the company. And what they would do would be to open a brand new account, funnel just enough money over into the account, then funnel the money back and close the account so they hit their target numbers. Fluffing. Mm-hmm. But it didn't actually generate any true profits for the company. But they were planning on paying and rewarding and promoting people who met their goals consistently. Metrics. Just about metrics. It is this is about- why it's all about the numbers is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. The ivory tower effect strikes again. And this is why lazy fair capitalism is not good. And well, yeah, it costs it cost the company money because every time a new account is opened, mail is generated. A whole welcome pack is, or, is generated. Big. This is why enormous yeah. banks are an enormously bad idea. Uh, wow. Mega corps are not good. They're not. Competition is necessary for a healthy economy. Yep. Um, and they got their hands caught in the cookie jar. And most of the reason why 
these employees have been fired is is less that it was costing the company money. It's more that there was a federal investigation and they got the big fine. Yep. Wow. That's why because you you can't tell me in an organization of banking, which is literally all about the numbers, that they had no way of accounting for how these employees were consistently meeting these goals. Or how they were, again, one of the, the, the scams that were was being happening in LA was uh, they would open premium checking accounts for Latina immigrants, enabling them to send money across the border at no charge. Mm-hmm. They could be opened with just 50 bucks, yeah. but we're supposed to have at least 25 K on deposit within three months. Otherwise they got a $30 charge. What they would do is they would downgrade the original account and then open a new premium and just keep cycling it. So the fees never ke- kicked in. Uh-huh. And, but it was such small numbers in what they were losing that the company didn't care and didn't notice. It wasn't until somebody did some actual investigative journalism and then pass it on to the feds yeah. that this got caught. What I yeah, love I, is I like the sentences here. This is similar to teaching to the test. Absent consequences, test scores are an excellent measure of underlining educational achievement. Yeah. And it's that same idea. That's, we don't care, just give us the numbers, get us the numbers, get us the numbers. They yeah. weren't asking how, why, anything else. Yeah, and it's, it's very much that ivory tower mentality. It, it really totally is. And, and I, I like this sentence. Uh, opening and closing unauthorized accounts like this is illegal and annoying for customers. <laughs> and it does nothing to, do, to make them, uh, money for the, for the bank. Illegal and annoying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Double that's trouble. Even worse. Double trouble right there. But that's the truth. And again, it, it, it's another sad state of affairs. Why... You can't trust the banks as they are currently. You really can't. And this is not like a practice the bank was doing. This is an unintended consequence of the bank policy with employees. Yep. Unintended consequences. Yeah. A book about the 21st century. (laughs) Why did so many employees do things like this? Because they were evaluated and paid based on how many new accounts they opened. Again, it was trying to hit the metrics, so you kept your job and you excelled. Mm-hmm. It's name. not caring about people, <laughs> it's caring about numbers. We need all of our businesses to stop functioning that way. Well, it's not about the numbers, it's about the people, folks. Caring about people starts with a management structure that cares about people. and You can't have a management structure that cares about people when they're so disconnected from the people that they're managing that they don't even know who they are. And that's the problem with the mega banks in a nutshell. Is uh, your management team, they have no idea who you are. Nor will they care unless you make big enough waves in your local branch to make a regional impact. Yeah. Wait, wait, How are you going to do that? By playing the game and the rules that they set forth for you. Well enough to make it there, and uh, who really cares how you did it? Most of the time, I would say they simply don't. This was probably a very long-standing practice, Mm -hmm. and given how widespread it must have been to assess a $186 million fine for having done it. Yeah. (laughs) Well, again, what you just said is true, the... I said here, I'm not saying incentive comp is useless. Indeed, I suspect the reason Wells Fargo failed to clamp down these practices for so long is that the high pressure to cross-sell that spawned these scams was also quite effective at motivating employees to sell real, profitable products to willing customers. Yeah, but they, they did not care that fraud was happening to do it. They were defrauding their own system, and the bank didn't care. They didn't take a close enough look. Like you said, it was a loss leader. 
It was a loss century. later. Yeah. So we have we have a title for the show for the, for this show, unintended, illegal, and annoying consequences. Okay. <laughs> oh no, unintended consequences, illegal and annoying. <laughs> well, not all of them are though. <laughs> not all of them are. Okay, so now we're going to get into pharmaceuticals. Well, that was good. Yep. So out on Alternet, what's going on here? Maker of deadly uh, fentanyl? Fentanyl. 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 Okay. Kicks in half a million dollars to defeat pot legalization in Arizona. Yep. We're actually following the money. (laughs) Okay. Go ahead. Rip it up. Marijuana legalization advocates have long argued that pharma companies which would lose out if marijuana was legal, are the staunchest supporters of pot prohibition. We have proof of it in Arizona. Um, uh, our, our, our new new interesting uh, pharma company on the block, uh, Insys, uh, it, it, uses, it makes one product. It's called Subsys. It is a sublingual fentanyl spray. Now, it is a sen- fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, several dozen times more potent than heroin. Uh, it has been linked to numerous opioid overdose deaths across the country, especially when mixed with heroin. Surprise, surprise. Huh. Uh, uh, in the past month, two former company employees pleaded not guilty to federal charges related to an alleged kickback scheme to get doctors to, to prescribe subsis. And Weird. Illinois Attorney General Lisa Madigan filed a lawsuit against the company charging that Insys hawked the drug to doctors for off-label prescribing. Wow. And now they are spending tons of money to make it so that, well... Marijuana legalization does not happen in Arizona. Insys's desire for increased profits led to disregard disregard patients' health and push addictive opioids for non FDA approved purposes. Yep. Good job, man! That is everything bad with the pharmaceutical industry, right there. All in one kid and caboodle. Wow. Responding to a query from U.S. News and World Report, the anti-legalization group Arizonans for Responsible Drug Policy said it would not return the donation. Instead, it released a statement expressing gratitude for the donation and pointing out that Insys is an Arizona-based company, unlike the Marijuana Policy Project, MPP, which backs the legalization effort. Well, they're local, so totally they're they're in they're in our pocket, you know. Totally, totally. way better. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's as bad as you think it is. The MPP backed Arizona campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol responded with a statement from campaign director J.P. Holyak who laid into both Insys and the opposition group that took its money. He said, We are truly shocked by our opponent's decision to keep keep the donation from what appears to be one of the most unscrupulous members of Big Pharma. You have a company using profits from the sale of what has been called, quote, the most potent and dangerous opioid on the market, end quote, to prevent adults from using a far less harmful substance. In addition to selling an extremely potent and dangerous opioid, they have been under investigation by numerous states and the federal government for the manner in which they have done so. Neat. Wow. Yeah, that pretty much kind of sums it up. Yep. Um, oh, their homepage touts the de- their development of pharmaceutical cannabinoids. Yeah, this is the uh, MPP, yeah. Okay, no, so no, now Insys. I know it's, Insys it's is designed for. Insys is making Oh. is making synthetic versions. They're That's making what, synth marijuana? Yes, they're making synth marijuana. That's why they don't want anybody to have the regular stuff. 
Oh, good heavens. Because then they can prescribe the synth stuff. It just keeps going deeper. Yeah. And Subsys does have a, which has the fentanyl, has a purpose. It is actually for uh, severe pain relief. Typically t- for use for yeah. cancer patients. It's an opioid, yeah. That's the same reason why... Uh, um, oh, what's the big one? Morphine? Morphine, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the same reason why morphine is prescribed. Is it highly addictive? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have drugs to just try to get you off of it. <laughs> oh, so that's that's what they're doing. They're trying to get their... They're trying to make the way clear for their own synthetic. They're trying to keep the way clear for their own synthetic. Yeah. They already got follow, it out there. Follow the money, the which then clear. follows the money. Yep. There you go. There's the rabbit hole. Did and you, you can... want to go down the rabbit hole? Nope. I hope you wanted to go down the rabbit I hole. I don't... Nope. Not today. Not today. We've, we've been down enough rabbit trails already. So, yeah. hey, let's talk about guns. <laughs> <laughs> but not American guns. But not American ones. guns. British nope. guns. British you know, guns. The ones help lose the war. I mean, sorry, that was 200 years the ago. The British government continues to sell arms to Saudi Arabia, which are being used to commit crimes against humanity in Yemen, which has been clearly detailed by the UN and other independent agencies. Will the Prime Minister commit today to halting arms sales to Saudi Arabia that have been used no. to prosecute this war in Yemen with the humanitarian devastation that has resulted from that. He referred to uh, what happens in Saudi Arabia as uh, being, I think he used, uh, implied that it was a threat to the safety of people here in the UK. Actually, what matters is the strength of our relationship with Saudi Arabia on issues like dealing with terrorism, on counter-terrorism issues. It is that relationship that has helped to keep people on the streets of Britain safe. I love the Prime Minister question hour. Screw humanitarian efforts. We need to make more money here. And what about the fear? Have you talked about the fear yet? I'm going to talk about the fear that you should have right now. Yeah. Again, when it comes to (sighs) weapons export, uh, it is one of the primary uh, exports of Britain. They they like to sell the guns. <sighs> and, oh, and and also to change a thing we said earlier, <laughs> uh, following the article they have that came out on the fourth of September of this yeah. year, Britain is actually now the second biggest arms dealer in the world. Really? Oh, with two thirds of UK weapons having been sold to Middle Eastern countries since two thousand ten. Neat. Well, there you go. Wow. Yeah. And the implications so there are staggering. And it's not just Saudi Arabia, which is, again, prosecuting a, a war, essentially, in Yemen. Oh, yeah, yeah. No question about it. And, again, this is a, a fight between uh, the Labour, which is the Liberal Party in Britain, and the Tories, which is the Conservative Party in Britain, not to be cons- confused with the Conservative Party of Britain. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, look, since 2010, Britain has, sold, has also sold arms to 39 of the 51 countries ranked not free on the Freedom House Freedom in the World report, and 22 of the 30 countries on the UN government's own human rights watch list. Yeah. Um, again, further into this... Uh, article on the independent Mm -hmm. which you can get in our show notes yep um is the government has argued it and the tory government has argued it has not seen evidence of saudi war crimes which foreign secretary boris johnson one of our favorites Mm -hmm. said last week meant a key test for halting sales has not yet been met really yeah uh, okay. Apparently, the weight of evidence of violations of international humanitarian law by the Saudi led coalition um, is not enough in the eyes of the Tory government, even though it is so great that it is very difficult to continue 
to support Saudi Arabia uh, in the eyes of the Newsnight program. Uh, wow. Over there. Uh, 3.3 billion pounds of arms exports to Saudi Arabia in the first year of the country's bombardment of Yemen. Is that it? 2.2 billion worth of so-called ML-10 licenses, which is equipment including drones, helicopters, other aircraft. A further 1.1 billion worth of ML-4 licenses were also issued relating to bombs, missiles, grenades, and countermeasures. The UK additionally signed off on a 430,000 pound worth of licenses for armored vehicles and tanks. According to this, uh, a joint analysis conducted by the Independent and Campaign Against the Arms Train found that 10 billion pounds, uh, this is the currency pounds, in arms licenses were issued through 20, uh, from 2010 to 2015 to regimes designated unfree by Freedom House, including China, Oman, Turkmenistan, and UAE. 7.9 billion pounds worth of arms were sold. This is not weight again, that's money. <laughs> were sold to countries on the human rights priority list. Priority countries. Which, yeah. wow. And for wow. people who are wondering about this new group that we were just mentioning, Freedom House, it is a U.S. based nonpartisan group, 501, uh, U.S. government funded non governmental organization that conducts research and advocacy on democracy, political freedom, and human rights. It was founded in 1941. Really? Yep. Me? 1941? Yeah. October of 1941. Just so you, so you know where this is coming from, one, this has been around for a while, and two, wow. yeah. I've never heard of them. Neither had I. This is why you come to our show, people. We do the hard work for you. 1941. Jeez. You know, I, I still want to go through and, and make a list of um, of these, you know, three-letter, four-letter agencies. Oh, okay, maybe a little more for, like, DARPA. You know, and just, you know... The alphabet agencies. The alphabet agencies, and, and just break them down and, and go through the list of how many government agencies are there. Did oh, you know... We can call the show, Welcome to Your ABCs. Did you know that... You had this and this and this and this and this and this. Well, I was going to do it as like Topic Tuesday posts and things like that, but you know, I, that works. I, I was just so inundated with uh, life that I, I just stopped doing. We for, need for to now. dedicate a year to no. Oh no, no alphabet man. soup. Longer. No. Than oh my that. god. No, no, it's easy. We that. need twenty six shows. No, what you need is it to be a separate segment. This yeah. week's alphabet soup. Yeah. Well, yeah, this we week's three-letter agency. I think we could do that. Just start doing a three-letter agency segment. Uh, we can call it Super Salad. Soup we, or oh, Salad? Wow. We're, we're highlighting <laughs> this agency. Why, well, yes, it. I would love to have a Super Salad. <laughs> oh, no. I like it. Do you want a Super Salad? <laughs> yes. That way we can keep it after the alphabet soup. Che- Chef Boyadi. <laughs> oh, he would be proud. Okay, 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 okay. Well, you know what? Um, that that wraps up the bad ideas. So now we're into just just the uh, the after dinner cordial. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and as meals go, yes. Ah, yes. This is lovely, lovely. So um, I found out uh, for my personal pick. I found out that the build team trio. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Troy Belice. Grant Demahara and uh, and Carrie Tor- Byron. Byron are going to have their own new show on Netflix. Because Netflix is smart. Netflix is smart. <laughs> Netflix so, wait, there's, wants there's, your money. There, there's people yeah. who like these. There's a market here. Thank you. They're making, they're making some really solid decisions. Whoever is running Netflix as far yeah. as picking their shows that they're going to carry... Beautiful when you have a group that goes, we don't care about ratings, just make good shit. Well, also, amazingly, they're not even really promoting them. It's all word of mouth. That's the best. Why waste money? Uh, yeah. Why waste money when it just happens? Well, it's like, well, we're just going to have it on the servers. Mm-hmm. They'll find it. 
Yeah. <laughs> or we're just going to tell a couple of these news outlets, and yeah. it'll just take off by itself. They'll find it. It'll be fine. No, no big deal. Yeah, we'll All they need is some little press. just a minor press release, like also, this one on the Nerdist. Well, wildfire. Here's the yeah. other thing with, with, especially with these three, they already have such an online following through, yeah. through Twitter, Instagram, etc. Yeah. That, and it's also in their best interest to promote the show. Yeah. Netflix doesn't have to do a thing but pay for the production of the show. Right. So uh, this is, it's called White Rabbit Project. Follow the White Rabbit. <laughs> Go down the rabbit hole on the internet. <laughs> it's right there. So it's a lot of the things that we do. Um, so this Except should be... with money. <laughs> yeah. So it should be, uh, should be a lot of fun. Uh, when's it coming out? When's it coming out? Uh, right now, that's all the information we have. Searches for Netflix and White Rabbit bring up a movie called White Rabbit. It sounds downright disturbing and not sciency <laughs> at all. <laughs> and parsing the language carefully, it isn't clear if they're literally coming back as the build team or if that's merely a term used to describe these three people in any capacity. After Alice in Wonderland, though, there is the first thing that comes to mind when we hear White Rabbit is feed your head, which is what they've always done with science. It is set to premiere globally on Netflix December 9th. My Google Foo is strong. Your Google Foo is strong. Merry Christmas, folks. <laughs> yes. So for Christmas, uh, Netflix gives you the White Rabbit Project. So enjoy. All right. Hey, Daniel, what you got here? Well, going uh, off of... Uh, some stuff you mentioned earlier. Um, this is uh, Wormwood Gaming Project uh, Products, and they're doing a charity drive called Box of Hope. Um, Box of Hope is uh, you can buy a a box that holds a wooden worry stone. Um, proceeds from the sale of this products go towards uh, Take This, which is a charity about raising awareness on mental health issues, um, removing the stigma around mental health, and uh, is very geek culture and uh, tech culture focused. Well, of course, because Take This is, is the sword, mm -hmm. which is what they've got on the shield. Take yeah. This, it's not safe to go alone. No. Yeah. So. And yeah. Um, no, it's it's very affordable. Wormwood's one of my my uh, something I always eye and go if I had more money because they have such such nice products. Uh, if you're a gamer with money to throw around, uh, we're we're talking about uh, handcrafted wooden deck boxes if you play Magic or dice rolling boxes or dice rollers. It's it's really good stuff. They just not too long ago had a Kickstarter for a uh, deck box that had a Bluetooth enabled finder. Hmm. So if you lost it at a con or anything, you could find it. Um, everything is, is is done with a level of care that is well appreciated. Um, but again, uh, mental health is a a a cause that's sort of near and dear to my heart. And uh, this is with a, a good company, a good charity, and a good cause. I'm just looking at that, and that is a laser-engraved sword on, on the wooden shield. Mm -hmm. You know, because I've got a laser engraver. It's right there. Yep. <laughs> so I totally understand how that is. The nice thing about this is, you know, this thing is they've got... You know, it's a random wood you get, but one out of every 100 is from Gabon Ebony, which I just looked at it. It's this beautiful, rich black wood. Uh, it's also insanely expensive and exceptionally rare. <laughs> so, nice. um, but you, you get your own little custom geeky gaming worry stone, as it were, made out of... Um, rare and and beautiful woods uh and the proceeds go to an excellent cause excellent 
Nice. Very nice. So that's out at Wormwood Gaming, W-Y-R-M, Wood Gaming, one word. Go take a look at that. And, of course, we've got the link in our show notes. And, Stephen, best fidgeting device invented? Fidgeting. Yes, this is fidgeting? something I came across actually a very short while ago. And I, I full disclosure, I have now kickstarted this. This is called the Fidget Cube. If you okay. like fidgeting or you just feel you have to like constantly play with stuff, pins, coins, your rings, whatever, they've decided, you know, we need something that everybody can use, every fidgeter can use, and will help them concentrate because science has actually shown that if you're fidgeting when you're playing with something, you actually concentrate better. Test scores can be better as well. So they created this device. On one side, it actually has a traditional worry stone style thing, but you've got things like clicker buttons on it, like a pin clicker, if you want to do that. Um, they've got a simple, like, joystick on one side. The standard light switch flick is on it. You've got, uh, like, the, uh, like a briefcase uh, lock mechanism. Combination the lock. The combination yeah. locks on that, with a little, uh, like, a Rollers. metal trackball with a roller. Uh, you've got a standard just... It's a disc that just rotates. And it's all these things you can just play with. And it fits very small, very portable. I was <laughs> like, I have I need this in my life. <laughs> huh. And other people who fidget, I'm going, they need this in their life too. Huh. And, and how, much, uh, how much was a fidget cube? Well, right now, uh, since we're past the early bird, right now they are $19 for Kickstarter. Uh, they will retail for about twenty five. The thing that blew me away is their original goal was fifteen thousand. That's what they set it out with. Yeah. Um, they started at their highest level, which is I think like forty two days. They have thirty nine days to go as of right now, which is September tenth. They have raised over. They have pledged over two point four million. I just went and climbing. Yeah. And climbing over sixty two thousand backers. Well, I'm I'm just sitting here and I'm watching the watching the numbers go up. Yeah. It's just this, I, I need this in my life. They also come in multiple colors. Um, they also wear their uh, goals. Uh, the Kickstarter goals they just came across was, hi, you can basically download a very, e very easy to print out just picture, blank picture of one of these. It has all the guidelines on it. Mm -hmm. And you can color it how you want. And they will make yours in that color scheme. Huh. Wow, I just sitting here, it's just going click, click, click. It's just going up and up and up. And we have over a month to go. I'm curious as to where this is going to be out. Then also they are if you're wondering about like some Kickstarters like, oh god, this is gonna take forever for it to get out to me, everything else. I will admit, they might have gotten a little over their heads as far as just how many I don't think they were expecting quite the numbers to roll in. Their expected rollout date for delivery of these is December of this year. Wow. I'm hoping they can hit it. If they can't, I, I'm looking a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. Wow. But they've already got the prototypes. They did all the prototyping and everything else. They're going, this is the final design. Let's go. But yeah, you can like, I mean, it's have super it in your simple. pocket and play with it. It's super simple. It's just a bunch of little widgets. Yeah. That do stuff. Huh. Well, just think of all the times you've been fidgeting with like a pen or everything else. Yeah. You're always clicking and you can just. Yeah, for the button now. clickers and everything. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm looking at this. Um, I I happen to know you know several people that that have autism and and spectrum disorders, and this might like really affect them positively. So yeah. I'm like, um, maybe I could order a few of these, and yeah. Hey, look, Christmas gifts. Yeah. Yeah, that might be the case. So, um, huh. Oh, I like the aqua one. That's cool. Sunset. Yeah, I, I like the uh, the midnight. Also, the Kickstarter special. I'm kind of curious about it. Okay, dice ah, is also nice. Retro. Retro. I like the retro one. Huh. You like the retro one, Dan? Retro's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty into the retro one. Retro and the Kickstarter exclusive. Those oh, are yeah, graphite. I, like. I, I do like the aqua. 
Aqua and uh, and retro, I think. Yeah. Yeah, totally about retro right there. Okay. I think Star Edition's good, though. Yeah. They're it's, all good. It's neat. I I like this. Thank you. You're welcome. This is cool. Okay. I occasionally bring neat stuff. Absolutely. No, we always bring cool stuff. That's why you wait through the whole damn show <laughs> for <laughs> to here. get to this. This is the dessert. <laughs> this is the dessert. This is your reward after going through the whole thing. Maybe it's a product review. Maybe it's something cool you need. Maybe it's it's a word of wisdom or two. Here you go. This is the we, good we, stuff. When the show posts, I will actually – actually, I will do that. If the show posts, if you'll let me, I will actually link this show to them to show, hey, look. Look what we're doing. Well, Sure. I mean, you might need to like post out like where it is in the show, and I'll I'll tell you that too. So yeah, we'll, we'll get like, that. You, who knows? We'll get we that. might get you know some uh, sponsorship. Oh, I I don't know. I don't know. I'm not holding my breath on anything. Okay, I David. I, I don't recommend holding breath. Hello. What's this? Oh, this is. If you want a good boot, <laughs> okay, you need to give somebody the boot. Um, so this is a this is a boot I picked up a while back. I hadn't really gotten a chance to actually use it so much and then we went camping finally yeah uh, and went through um it was interstate state park it was on the corner of minnesota and wisconsin mm-hmm. and we went hiking through some trails up there about four miles worth this boot's awesome <laughs> <laughs> um it's super comfortable it's super comfortable it grips on everything and the traction's phenomenal uh and it's Mostly waterproof. If water does get into it, it's got studs that allow the water to come out, which are below your where your actually foot sits. So you're you're on like a, a pretty thick sole, and underneath that sole, there's a there's a couple studs of uh, vents. I would like to call them and kind of show that there. Wow, all the, all the way up there. Yeah, your foot's pretty high up in the shoe. <laughs> Let me put you, or boot rather. Yeah, uh, there's there is a lot between your foot and the ground, which is great for if you're going over rocks and sharp huh. objects and everything else. Uh, things aren't going to get to your feet, and uh, yeah, really solid, really comfortable. Had no problems navigating the trail whatsoever. Did not slip on anything. Are those open or closed eyelets there? The loops, the loops, they are closed. Oh, okay. So I don't know if I could give you any nice. better view. Yeah, I was I thinking like that might those. be the case. Okay, because on a lot of boots, those are those are just the quick quick lace ups. But you know, no. in, in these, they're they're more closed and, and rugged. Yeah. Huh. Oh yeah, it's a, everything about this boot is really sturdy. Still got some dirt, but uh, yeah, it's just, quite an aggressive powder, tread pattern there. That's just powdered love. That's all that is. And powdered glove, yeah. <laughs> so the actual bottom of the shoe is kind of, it's a little, I want to say a little bit softer, so it actually conforms to the ground and actually helps get you more grip than you would otherwise have. Hmm. Other question is, how would this shoe, how would this boot work as an everyday wear? Um, it's a bit heavier than your average shoe. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm used to wearing, so, like, SWAT tactical boots. So then you, but I, I like everyday wear like that. Uh, but mine, of course, tend to fall apart. Um, uh, the the boots I bought from Red Wing were ten and a half wide. This actually has more room in them, so I might end up. I'm gonna put an extra like insole in there to to raise my foot up a little bit more, hold my foot a little bit tighter. So uh, because I it is a little loose on my foot with the size that I normally bought for boots in the past. So you might go a half size down, maybe. But okay. uh, hmm. I I'd wear them every day if I I might wear them every day in the winter. Hmm. So. Interesting. It, they it seems that they're running out. <laughs> <laughs> there is one left. Yeah. <laughs> and looking at the sizes available, not yeah. many. Not very many. So um, ten and a half. Ten and a half wide, one left. Two left. Good. They've got one for the left and the right foot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, really good boot. I'm totally on board with these things at this point. 
Oh, once I selected US, Prime came up. Yep. So they're Prime available. Okay. $127 Prime. Get them Monday. I, I don't need boots right now. But those are some good-looking boots. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And Fred had one, but he, he is not here, so we're going to have to have to take a look at what he was talking about. Oh, oh Luke Cage. Well, okay. I think I can jump on the, the this train. Yeah, I think we both Okay, can. <laughs> go for it. Go for it, uh, gentlemen. Okay, Luke Cage, a also known as Power Man for all of you old school comic book geeks. Um, part of Heroes for Hire. Uh, this is part of uh, Netflix, surprise, surprise. Um Marvel verse and their push towards this series, The Defenders. Uh, if you're familiar with Jessica Jones, which aired not that too long ago, um, you already are familiar with the character, but he's getting his own show. And from all the trailers, it is delightful, true to form to the character. He's he said "Sweet Christmas" already a couple of times. It's yes, fantastic. Yes. I am actually highly anticipating the show myself, so I can understand why it's Fred's pick. And it looks uh, coming out September 30th? Mm-hmm. So, look for it soon. All episodes, September 30th. So I need to finish Jessica Jones and other things before then. Gotcha. <sighs> oh, they're at my free time. <laughs> well, there you go. So, it's coming. It's coming. Some good stuff coming. And we were already talking about how, how awesome Netflix is doing. So this is, this is good. This is excellent. Excellent. And, um, well, gentlemen, thank you very much. But we have come to the end of yet another show. That is it for tonight. We'll be back next Friday about 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, how about continue those conversations on the web? Head over to the website, O'ReillyRadio.com. we got all the links right at the top of the page. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, Google+, and subscribe to the YouTube and the Twitch channels. Of course, you can watch us live and join in the fun in the chat room, all from our webpage right there. If you've stayed with us all the way through the credits, how about you give us a hand? If you have a few dollars spare, you can contribute to the Patreon and get early access to the show releases and even uh, get some special works here and there. Uh, just follow the Patreon link on the webpage. That'll take you over to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash O'Reilly Radio. You can also make a one-time donation via the donate button. Of course, you could do that more than once. I wouldn't mind. And, uh, you know, if you can't fit us into your rainy day funds, how about you do us a solid? Share the show. Leave us a review. We're always looking for new ideas for the show, so share what's on your mind. And uh, shoot us a note at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're the more talkative sort, of course you are. How about you leave us a voicemail, 470-222-6759. It's always ready to take your call or your text. And, uh, you know, that's it. We can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Until next time, this has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Cowan Services Network. Music for the show was created by Kevin McLeod of Comtech.com. And my cast of rogues, I've got Stephen Griffith, I've got David O'Connor. And I've got Daniel Atherton. And, of course, we, we had Steve, had uh, uh, Fred Sims earlier. So Hi, Fred. thank you, gentlemen. Once again, you have succeeded in completing our broadcast day. This session of Parliament has done well. <laughs> it's been concluded. Gentlemen, back to your rooks. <laughs> I don't know what was happening there. What are you talking about? A rookery. Nothing. A, a rookery. It's where you where you do the the. But get, that's, that's where you keep your owl. It's where you keep your owls, right? Oh. Uh, yeah. Didn't you read Harry Potter? That's uh, that's a thing. read it again. It's a thing. It's a it's a word. <laughs> it's, it's what we do. <laughs> we word things. We word things. <clears throat> it's what people do.